partnership with the Nerve Centre and Dr. Adrian Grant of the University of Ulster, we're delighted to bring you this two-part conference. The Divided, Dividing Island Conference is our last event linked to our exhibition and at the Tower Museum, which looks at the origins, the impact and the legacy of partition. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19 restrictions, many of you will have been prevented from visiting the Tower Museum. So what we're doing with the Nerve Centre, and in particular with Paula and John, who have proved crucial to this whole project, we are currently preparing a lot of digital content, which will be available online shortly. Do check out our website, towermuseumcollections.com, for an insight into some of the collections we have linked to this particular period of history, objects, archives, and also a link to all of the events we've run so far, we've had a hedge school with History Island. We had a fantastic event with archivists exploring the archives last month with Katrina Crow. And we also had a fascinating conversation with Dermot Ferreter and Garrett Carr in, I think it was October 2020. So today we have part one of the conference, The Road to Partition. And on Friday, we'll have part two, which will look at the legacy of partition. The panels have been put together with the support of Dr. Adrian Grant, whose knowledge and experience in this particular period of history has proved absolutely essential. And he's kept us right on all of this, um, for which we are very, very grateful. I'm delighted to introduce our chair for today and for Friday. Many of you will recognize Susan McKay. She is an award-winning writer and journalist. She currently writes for the Irish Times, the New York Times, and the Guardian and the Observer, amongst others. She has written extensively on social affairs and the legacy and impact of the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And she's also produced award-winning documentaries for radio and television. Once again, I thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon and I hope you enjoy this afternoon's event and do join us again on Friday. And I'd now like to pass you over to Susan, our chair for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernadette. Um, it's a huge pleasure and privilege to be uh, part of this conference. When Adrian Grant first asked me to get involved, it was going to be in Derry, and that was a, a wonderful draw. And it's, of course, very sad that uh, we can't be in Derry today to visit um, the Tower Museum and, and uh, see all the fantastic work that goes on there and indeed in the Nerve Centre. So but um, I do urge you to take up um, Bernadette's suggestion and have a look online at the archives, the wonderful archives that um, are there in the Tower Museum in relation to today's subject and, and many, many other aspects of uh, Derry's complicated, uh, long history. Um, this afternoon, we're talking about um, partition which of course is, is very much in everybody's minds at the moment. Um, and I'm going to introduce our very distinguished panel uh, in the order in which they'll be speaking to you this afternoon. It's really fantastic that so many of you have signed up. Um, Paula Larkin has, has told us that there have been actually over 500 people who have signed up this afternoon. So you're not going to be disappointed, I can assure you. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Robert Lynch. And uh, Robert will speak for about 10 minutes. He's a historian and author, and he's engaged very deeply with all aspects of partition in Ireland, its origins, its impact and its legacies. His book, Revolutionary Ireland, 1912 to 1925, came out in 2019, and it analyzes the main events in Ireland during that period from the initial crisis over the third Home Rule Bill in 1912 to the consolidation of the partition of Ulster, with the settling of the boundary issue in 1925. That's if you can say that the boundary issue has ever indeed been entirely settled. Um, he's also written a study of Irish republicanism in Ulster, the Northern IRA and the early years of partition 1920 to 22, and that was published in 2006. He teaches currently at the University of Glasgow uh, in Scotland, and he's taught and researched at various other universities around Britain and Ireland. And as well as his books, he's written a lot of scholarly articles on his subject of the 20th, 20th century history of Ulster. But he has actually suggested that homeschooling his um, primary school children may in fact be the most challenging sort of teaching he has ever been required to do, something which I'm sure a lot of the audience um, would have a lot of sympathy with. Um, our second speaker then is uh, Dr. Myrtle Hill, and Myrtle is going to speak again for 10 minutes 
about the important role of opening up Irish history. Uh, she's I'm sorry, she has played an important role in op opening up Irish history and insisting that bringing in excluded perspectives isn't just ethically responsible, but necessary if we're to truly understand the seismic events of the last 100 years and more. She's done this through her own feminist scholarship but also by her support for other feminists seeking to explore neglected aspects of our history. She's a community activist as well as an academic. She's a visiting research fellow in the School of History, Anthropology, Philosophy and Politics at Queen's University Belfast, and she was formerly a senior lecturer and director of the Centre of Women's Studies, which brought lots of um, brilliant young women into, into the field. She's published widely on Irish women's religious and social history with many book chapters and articles on the Irish suffrage movement, 19th century female missionaries, Ireland and empire and disability and conflict. She's currently researching links between feminism and the left in Irish history. And I'm sure that heads are going to roll over that. It's a, an extremely contentious subject, obviously. And uh, finally, uh, Dr. Margaret Ward, um, is uh, going to speak for for 10 minutes as well. And Margaret is one of those authors who books, whose books have really helped to turn the tide for feminism and historical scholarship from her first book on manageable revolutionaries in the 1980s to her recent, recent biogra biographical work on Hannah Sheehy Skeffington. Margaret is an honorary senior, senior lecturer at Queen's University and her latest publication is Gendered Memories and Belfast Come Bon, 1917 to 22, which is in Linda Connolly's book, uh, Women and the Irish Revolution. And Margaret's PhD is from the University of the West of England, and she's got an honorary Doctor of Laws from the University of Ulster for her contribution in advancing women's equality. And like Myrtle, she has done that through her work in community development as well as within academia. As part of the decade of centenaries, she's been involved in delivering lectures on women's involvement in suffrage, nationalist and unionist movements. And it's important to say that Margaret's work is just as widely read and followed by a non-academic as by an academic audience. So a really fascinating panel. And um, I think that you're going to get a lot of, of new insight into this um, really important period this afternoon. So we're going to start, as I said, with Robert. And um, Robert, you're going to put um, Irish partition into an international context. But just to start off with, you feel, don't you, that the period of partition has been somewhat neglected and maybe even overlooked in historiography. So can you talk to us a bit about why you think that is and also about how historians have approached it and where it fits within our understanding of uh, Europe after the First World War, please? Uh, Robert, you're still on mute. That's it. Yes, can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Um, so lovely to see you all, and um, thanks very much for attending this very important um, topic. Now, just in answer to that, sort of broad, broadly speaking, perhaps I think the most remarkable thing about the partition of Ireland is that it seems to come very much out of the blue. Um, there are very few seeming precedents. There is no, for example, historical demand for an Ulster Parliament or Ulster self-government. Indeed, when the Liberal MP Thomas Aguirre Roberts stands up in the House of Commons uh, in 1912 and moots the idea of dividing Ireland, um, he's called delusional by various people. And Asquith, the Prime Minister, and I'll just give you a quote from Asquith, um, calls the assumption that underlays this proposal radically false. You can no more split Ireland into parts than you can split England or Scotland into parts. I say that you have in Ireland a greater fundamental unity of race and temperament than any other place on earth. However, of course, this chimera that Ireland had at its heart, a, an innate natural division, and that partition was the logical, if rather crude, conferral of statehood on already homogenous uh, communities, forms the backbone of the partition settlement. And has also, of course, been very influential in historical scholarship. If you look from Heslinger to Stewart, historians have really scoured the kind of pre-partition landscape for evidence to confirm this development of two nations in Ireland, both shaped by in incompatible social, cultural, and political trajectories. But I think, to be fair, if you'd asked anyone in 1911 and told them that within a decade Ireland would have been partitioned, 
I think most of them would have thought you were rather delusional, like Roberts. So I think it's important to say that partition is very much a product of its time. And this is where the context comes in. By 1918, Robert's derided idea had become the cornerstone of Britain's answer to the Irish question. If you look at Lloyd George's speech, for example, in December 1919, he voices the exact opposite view to Asquith, his predecessor, just a few years earlier. The island is two nations and the whole thing is very natural. So I say context is very, very important. And we can argue that partition would not have happened, or certainly not in the same way, outside of this thin sliver of time during the decade which spanned the Great War. So if you look at the three dominant political groupings that we have during the partition settlement, Sinn Féin, the Ulster Unionists, and the British Coalition government, all represented in one form or another radical revolutionary projects and all were very short-lived. Of course, Sinn Féin itself falls, falls apart very quickly, only after five years. Belfast prosperity, for example, which very much underpins so many arguments against home rule, proves itself to be transitory and declines soon after the, the new border is put in place. So the point is, where does the partition idea really come from? And really what you've got is a combination of circumstance and political expediency that would make this idea of a natural division a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, now, viewed in its broader European context, of course, there's nothing unique about the partition of Ireland. Uh, in the wake of the Great War, the, the notion of drawing lines on maps and creating states which reflect the desire of perceived ethno-religious national groups is, is very much in, in vogue. Of course, we have Wilson's 14 points, the strive for self-determination, fired by really this deep-seated belief that it was unfulfilled nationalism, the frustration of the so-called submerged peoples, which really was the root cause of the conflict. And, you know, if you can go everyone their own little homogenous ethnically pure state and they all join the League of Nations and we have collective security, then you'll ensure against future conflicts. Now, of course, it doesn't work. I mean, if history shown us anything, drawing lines on maps never really works. Um, all of, almost all of these states uh, are left with sizable and troublesome minorities. All are woefully poor and almost all embrace authoritarianism and right-wing uh, populism. Also very quickly worth mentioning, of course, is the imperial context, which I think feeds into all this. Um, you know, by 1914, with all the world's spare land, as it were, taken by one global empire or another, um, retrenchment really becomes the order of the day. Um, we are in an age when all European powers are seeking to consolidate and develop their existing empires on a more sustainable footing. And Britain, of course, is no exception. Um, the problem, of course, the British are facing for a long time now is the increasing assertiveness of the self-governing white colonies. As time go on, they demand more latitude for political action. So they'll sign the Versailles Treaty separately. Their six votes in the League of Nations are really a sign of division rather than unity. So I think swirling round partition are the lingering embers of these ideas of sort of nullifying demands for self-determination by devolving power, whether that be imperial federalism or home rule all around in Britain itself. So this is all kind of in the wind. Now, after the war, the British themselves face a dilemma. And remember the third home rule bill is to be enacted when the war ends, which means the peace treaties when they're signed. So you either have to enact the third home rule bill, amend it or scrap it and start again. And of course they choose the latter. And you know, there's various options, county option. All these are rejected. The idea of giving unions a veto in an all Ireland Dublin parliament. Um, and eventually what they will settle on, of course, is the Government of Ireland Act. Um, these two now two devolved home rule parliaments within all Ireland embryonic government in the shape of the Council of Ireland. Now we might ask why this idea emerges. Well, one thing obviously is it gets the British out and gets them out for good. That's one thing, the British are quite happy to be leaving. Um, the addition of a Council of Ireland would itself be a stop to Irish unity. And of course, the idea is, is that you leave it to the Irish themselves to decide what powers this Northern Ireland component will have. So the British can't be blamed now. They're not responsible if you don't use the unity mechanism that they basically provided. And of course, you can also claim to the world, I suppose, if you can keep a straight face, that every Irish person is now living under a home rule parliament of some kind. And this is very vital in terms of appeasing, particularly American opinion at the time. And also you could even argue this is the only idea that even really stands any kind of slim chance of working and avoiding some terrible future bloodbath. 
Now, um, I mentioned this idea of um, other contexts. I suppose Ireland itself is a context, and this really leads on to the point about historians. Um, it's often forgotten, I think, that partition sees the creation of two states in Ireland, not one. You know, the island that you could say that existed before 1921 effectively disappears and is replaced by two new entities, each ruled over by the two winning factions of the period, which are pro-treaty Sinn Féin and, and Ulster Unionism. And both act, of course, in incredibly similar ways to assert their power. Both face these intransigent minorities, political and religious. Both face almost immediate civil wars. And also both of them follow the journey into the darkness of political authoritarianism, arbitrary arrests and extrajudicial killings, much like we've mentioned happens in Europe. And it's also important, of course, I suppose one big context is we talk about violence. Um, violence, coercion, the constant background noise to the partition of Ireland. And of course, there was lots of violence. Ireland sees lots of violence at this time. But there has been a tendency by historians to favour examination of certain types of violence over others. So, of course, we have lots on provincial ambushes, lots on revolutionary guerrilla warfare. But there's less focus on things such as mass rioting, sectarian massacres, communal expulsions, which we get, of course, in the northeast. And Belfast is one of, if not the most violent place in Ireland in this period. And it's often forgotten, I think. And, you know, the vast majority of the violence of partition, I think, remains murky and largely forgotten. And the memories of its victims, of course, uncollected, unlike those of the many paramilitaries who, of course, received the blessing of the new partition states. So if we're looking, I would argue, for a shared, as it were, all Ireland historical framework for this period, then partition is surely a, a very strong candidate. Sadly, though, I think the subject itself still stands very much on the kind of periphery of, um, of the period. And this is particularly striking because, you know, as the partition experience of other post-colonial states has, has inspired a, a huge, rich and varied um, historiography. And, you know, much like Palestine, India, the partition experience of Ireland seems to define it in the 20th century. As a historical process, there are many similarities, a rapid post-war decolonization set against the backdrop of nationalist revolution, followed by an ill-conceived and rather clumsy attempt to transfer power, midwifed by a cynical and war-weary British establishment. And similarly, as I said, all these lines are made, made workable only through repeated short-term modifications of the plan and these horrific levels of, of violence violence, leaving behind really embittered minorities and a legacy of acrimony and political instability. And what we do tend to have, I think, is partitioned history, these competing national stories. And because partition itself stands at the cusp of this division, it tends to fall through the cracks. Um, and the nationalist narrative itself remains, of course, incredibly dominant. And, you know, for some historians, it has to be said, there's been a tendency to reduce modern Irish history to a, a sort of teleological biography of the southern nation state. That's what it's about. And historians themselves have, I think, inadvertently fueled these popular misconceptions by allowing nationalist frameworks and periodization to shape the narrative. So what I, I would argue what you need to do going forward is to move partition now from the periphery of our understanding of this period back to the centre. If we do this, and if we view events through the prism of partition, as it were, we'll not only be able to situate Ireland's experience within a broader European imperial context, but also create, you know, maybe for the first time, a truly all Ireland Irish history. Now, I think that's very important. Thank you, Susan. Thanks. Thank you very much, Robert. That was fascinating. So, um, Myrtle, you're going to take us through probably a different set of contexts, although I'm sure that there will be some overlap with the, the context that Robert has, has brought in. Um, but, you know, you've, you've mentioned before that there was a lot of unrest of one kind or another during this period, a lot of agitation and a lot of communal fear um, in, within different groups. To what extent do you think did the wider social and political context contribute to the debates that did go on around home rule and partition at the time? Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Robert, for that great overview um, of the wider context um, of partition. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to go much more local and look at events 
uh, in the turbulent decade before the war, which saw changes impacting the whole of society at that time, from government policies right through to workplace uh, relationships. At the topmost level, the House of Lords lost its veto in 1911. <clears throat> while from the late 19th century, the decreasing power of landlords to influence votes in their locality ensured a shifting balance of power between the landed gentry uh, and their rural electorate. The extension of the franchise and industrialization disrupted relations between employers and employees. Men and women campaigned for a range of often overlapping issues, in addition to home rule, for and against, and indeed in all its varied forms, they also fought for the female vote and for the rights of workers. Demands for change on all these fronts became increasingly militant in this decade and contributed to rising tensions, revealing a seriously divided and disordered society on the eve of partition. The late 19th century, of course, witnessed the growing power of organized labor throughout Britain with strike action becoming a familiar weapon against employers. In Belfast, the centre of shipbuilding and linen, Connolly and Larkin provided effective leadership and indeed engendered great fear uh, amongst business owners of a wider socialism. Women also came to the fore at this time, however, um, looking at women like Mary Galway, Winifred Carney, uh, Ellen Gordon. Um, so that the, the call for fair treatment in the workplace really covered uh, the whole of um, the labour force. The biggest strike was probably the Belfast Dock Strike of 1907, which uh, resulted in violence, rioting, police mutiny, uh, and troops uh, coming to break up those riots. There's also, of course, uh, in Dublin, the lockout of 1913. And in these instances, we see brief examples of class unity, which would be swamped uh, beneath uh, the, the wider anxiety about home rule. The skilled workers' fear of losing jobs, for example, was woven into the broader narrative of Ulster Unionism and thus reduced to sectarian antipathy. Another campaign which sought to rise above party or religious difference was that for the female vote. Irish suffrage numbers, uh, members numbered around 3,000, but they were very visible and very vocal as they sought to make their case. Their frustration with successive governments led from peaceful to increasingly militant demonstrations. The Irish Women's Suffrage Society based in Belfast and closely in touch with the Pankhurst Women's Social and Political Union favored the violent uh, approach and the militant approach and when Ulster Unionists vehemently denied an earlier claim that a breakaway Ulster would give votes to women, they declared war on Ulster Unionism. The Women's Social and Political Union set up an Ulster Centre in Belfast, replacing the earlier society, and from March 1914 organised a series of attacks on Unionist facilities. About five buildings uh, were burnt down. The first and largest was Abbeylands here, in County Antrim, Lisburn Cathedral was also attacked, as were sporting venues like bowling and tennis pavilions, Newton Arts Race Course, not Golf Club. In all, about 13 arrests of women uh, took place between March and August 1914, resulting in very dramatic uh, courtroom scenes widely reported and not a little violence against suffrage, suffragists themselves uh, on the streets. Their action, uh, of course, was disrupted by war. But before then, the Ulster question and the involvement of English women in the campaign in Ulster raised tensions between nationalists and pro-union suffragists. Irish suffrage leaders found female unity increasingly difficult to maintain. On the home rule question itself, we see the move from Irish to Ulster unionism. The decline of landlord power was particularly felt outside Ulster. The landed gentry, as I've said, lost influence over their tenants because of electoral reform, such as the secret ballot, the extension of the franchise, and the land acts of constructive unionism, which increased tenant right at their expense. The remaining pockets of Irish unionism lacked authority or influence in face of rising nationalism. And that 
at nationalist pressure was growing and diversifying. Bolstered by O'Connell's Catholic emancipation victory, they made religious, social, cultural, and political advances. Uh, it's also interesting uh, the many ways in which that nationalism diversified. Kelly calls it feminist, socialist, democratic, and revolutionary. It's also cultural. Uh, the IPP uh, represented a devolved uh, wish and Fein talked about a dual monarchy, but the Irish Ireland Act was um, followed, pursued uh, by many groups, uh, again, including a lot of female groups uh, led by Markievicz and Maud uh, Gon. Uh, and the Irish Ireland movement made enormous strides outside Ulster. Austrian nationalism was created in opposition to Irish nationalism. The North, as we know, was different demographically with its uh, solid um, Protestant uh, population. And Alvin Jackson points to the many shared interests binding the British, <coughs> excuse me, and Irish aristocracy. Connections formed through culture and politics, through an entire way of life and value systems, whether it was going to the races, support for loyalty. Again, a female example here is Lady Londonderry's close connections with leading British parliamentarians. Uh, as a, a salon hostess, she was a friend and confidant of Carson and close to Bonner Law, the Conservative leader from 1911. So there were lots of joint interests and mutual loyalty. The Ulster base for home rule activity came with the formation of the U Ulster Unionist Council in 1905, bringing various groups together, and followed a year later by the Ulster Women's Unionist Council, which by 1913 had between 115 and 200,000 members, by far the largest female uh, organisation in Ireland, and headed up by Lady Londonderry. This group was extremely active on behalf uh, of the union, bringing all classes of, of women together, and also travelling across Britain to make speeches arguing that sectarianism was not the only problem uh, in Ulster, arguing particularly uh, about concern for the economy. They stressed their loyalty to the crown and devotion to empire. We see the mobilization of popular Protestantism by these groups, the evangelical strain, which had um, within Presbyterianism, indeed within all Protestant uh, denominations, had been given a significant boost by the 1859 revival, which also strengthened its anti-Catholic strand. What was seen as the erosions into pro Protestant supremacy was exacerbated by post-famine population change, which saw the movement from South Ulster to the North, especially Belfast, by those with a history of agrarian and sectarian unrest. There were more Catholics around basically at a time uh, when the Home Rule Bill were coming forward. There were more churches, more chapels, more uh, religious orders and so forth. So that uh, simmering tensions erupted into anti-sectarianism as each Home Rule Bill was protested. Provocative parades by the uh, Orange Order and the Ancient Order of Hibernians Hibernians were, were flashpoints. In June 1912, an attack by Hibernians on a train full of Sunday school children at Castle Dawson was quickly followed by the expulsion of Catholic shipyard workers in Belfast. The papal decree that, decree that children of mixed marriages should be raised, raised as Catholics took on a sinister local relevance when the children of a Mrs McCann were taken by her Catholic husband because she, as a Presbyterian, refused to comply with the Vatican decree. So you had these sparks of anti-sectarianism uh, really flamed uh, by big rallies and impassioned uh, speeches culminating in Ulster Day, 28th September 1912, when not only 237,000 men signed the covenant of, of loyalty to Britain, but also 234,000 uh, women. The argument being that they should put the union first and many women in this, uh, in this grouping uh, arguing about the sanctity of family life because of that McCann experience. The UVF, uh, founded by local gentry and businessmen, took on arming and drilling. And, and indeed, the suffrage uh, movement were extremely angry 
that, for example, their members were imprisoned for throwing stones, while these men marched, brought in arms, drilled, threatened civil war at no such cost. In summary, really, uh, what you have here are a range of contested loyalties, Imperial, British, Ulster, Irish, issues around the constitution, around gender, the economy, culture and identity. Equality meant different things for different people. Constructed, as I said, in opposition to Irish nationalism, Ulster unionism sought to hold together diverse interests, capitalising on perceived vulnerability, on hostility, fear, frustration and uncertainty about the future. And in an increasingly militant context, unionism hardened its uh, position. All this bubbling under the surface uh, would re-emerge in later years to bring a, a political a hardening of, of position uh, where we have moved from defence of the union with Britain to defence of Ireland to defence of Ulster itself at all costs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Myrtle. That was a fascinating insight into the cultural context of change, which I think really sort of deepens and expands our understanding. Sometimes as a journalist, I sort of think it'd be nice to just hide away in history. But then when you hear presentations like the last two and no doubt Margaret's, you learn just quite how naive that thought is. Um, so many things are, are different, but the same, aren't they? with the present day in, in Ireland. Um, so our last speaker for the afternoon is Margaret, Margaret Ward. And um, Margaret, a lot of your work has been about restoring women's contexts and contributions to history. So can you say something to us about how women's activities and experiences enhance our understanding of Irish society and the impact of war in the years leading up to partition? Thank you, Susan. And, uh... Uh, it's great following uh, Robert and Myrtle. I'll overlap slightly as we intertwine our different perspectives and uh, experiences into an overall look at this period. So, as you say, what I want to look at is what would the historical record look like if women were really part of it and we had a truly gendered understanding of the past? This is a really brief uh, look at this time, but so I'll start off with looking at organised feminism, which always thought in all island terms because the common enemy was patriarchy and the male control of institutions and the suppression of women's voices. And we've heard from Myrtle about the suffrage movement, um, campaigning not only for women's right to the vote, but for the transformation of society uh, and, and, and the women's voices to be part of a whole range of, uh, whether it's the criminal justice system or whatever, they were demanding to be considered citizens in a new Ireland being planned and campaigned for before um, the First World War. And they tried very hard to leave aside the issue of the constitutional arrangement in which women would exercise the vote, whether it was going to be a home rule parliament or as part of the UK, even indeed in 1913, when the Ulster Unionists were threatening a provisional government that would secede from a home rule Ireland. And for a while they had said women would get the vote in that. Feminists didn't take a position on that other than to congratulate Ulster Unionists for seeing women's potential uh, as equal citizens. So they, were, they trod a very delicate line at this time. But 1914 and war sees the disintegration of that feminist movement. Republicans use the war to assert Irish sovereignty in the Easter Rising. Unionists use it as an opportunity to cement their position within the United Kingdom by supporting the British government's war effort. And the Irish party nationalists thought supporting war would help to win home rule. Women in the North who'd been suffragists but sympathetic to unionism now supported the British war effort. And for several months, an effort was made to unite women in Belfast under the Irish Women's Franchise League banner by setting up a northern centre, but there were criticisms. It was too nationalist. The Franchise League's position was votes for women and damn your war. So at this time, a few women turned to labour politics. Some nationalist women joined Cumann Amman, and a few from Belfast also took part in the Easter Rising. 
And as Myrtle has said, more women joined the Ulster Women's Unionist Council, the largest organisation of women in Ireland, but it was solely focused on defence of the union. Their position was home rule would mean a domination of the Catholic Church. It would threaten family life. And you can see, I think, the growing politicisation and confidence of Cumann Amman in the years 1914 and 22, and contrast that with that of the unionist women pledged to defend the union through defending their men. Because we had the proclamation of Easter week, which promises equal rights and equal opportunities to women and a government elected by the votes of men and women. It's a highly significant pledge. It's the first time in any revolutionary situation that revolutionaries support women's citizenship. So by the time we come to the 1918 elections, women within Sinn Féin have, feel they have the authority now to be arguing for women to be candidates, and they caucus within Sinn Féin. They work hard with former suffragists to have Constance Markiewicz elected, and they give as much support to Winifred Carney standing in East Belfast as their resources allowed. And you could argue that this contrasts with unionist women who didn't put forward women candidates as the parliamentary arena seen very much as a job for men. Women could be in local government, but they saw the defence of the union, etc., being very much a male task. And women joining Kamen Amman in the north at this time, a real commitment was needed because Republicans in Ulster are very isolated. It's calculated that Sinn Féin and County Antrim in 1921 has less than 1% of the population. And Belfast Cumann the Man has no more than 150 members at its height. But by 1918, the nationalist movement um, through the actions of the British government is really regenerating, largely through the support of women because so many men are in jail. The German plot arrests give um, the Crumlin Road jail prisoners from all over Ireland and they're tended by and um, supported by Cumann Amman, which develops new branches in Belfast. By nine, Easter 1920, the IRA offensive starts in Ulster. Uh, it's, it's got orders to start from, from HQ in, in the south. It burns tax offices and attacks RIC barracks. And when we think about that, how can we have a guerrilla war in urban and rural settings without women? And it's interesting, Roger McCauley, who was the foremost IRA gunman in Belfast at the time, provides 54 pages of testimony as what he did in Belfast over these years, never mentions women. Yet we know Winifred Carney did the reconnaissance work before the tax office attack. Mary Russell supplied arms for the Ballina Hinch and Crossgar Barracks, just two examples. And the pension files from women show that they took on all sorts of military roles, scouting, arms, transportation, sheltering volunteers, carrying messages, developing communication lines, for example, supporting the, fir the fourth Northern Division of the IRA. They set up a communication line that stretched from Ballycastle in the north to Loch Ney uh, in the west. They brought rifles and golf bags from Belfast to Cavan by train and did all sorts of other things. But women not involved in conflict were also deep not involved in politics, were deeply impacted by conflict. We hear a lot about the shipyard workers expelled, but there were also 1,800 women mill workers expelled from their jobs, and more women were killed here than anywhere else in Ireland. In just under two years, between in 1920 to 22, 78 women died uh, in Belfast, all innocent civilians, a lot of them women uh, on messages, you know, uh, looking after their children or whatever. We also need much more research on the gender-based violence that occurred during war. And women like Linda Connolly and Mary McAuliffe have started this. So take women and hair cutting. If you look at the Irish Times in 1920, I found just three examples on a quick look. There was a woman whose husband was a shipyard worker, another whose husband was a member of the Orange Order, another woman was a shop assistant whose shop was being robbed. They, the men were all taken out, uh, were out, but the revenge was taken on women who all had their hair very roughly shorn, and this kind of humiliation of women. When we come to women in the 1920 local government elections, 
a total of 42 women are elected throughout Ireland, but Irish Citizen, the suffrage paper, said that Sinn Féin set a good example. Nationalists and unionists follow very tardily and Labour ignored women. So in Belfast, we had Florence Clark and Julia McMordy, in Coleraine and Mrs. Kidd. They're the only unionist women returned in the Northeast. And in Derry, we have two nationalist women, Florence O'Sullivan and Margaret Morris. And, it, you know, there were questions like, did nationalist women in Belfast want to stand? Would it have been too dangerous to be publicly identified? But the consequences are that we had so few women in public life at this time as the northern state is beginning. The unionist government suppresses councils with nationalist majorities. And the late Maurice Hayes talked once about a second flight of the earls at this time, as the northern state consolidates, those who could have given political leadership are forced to leave. And this has huge impacts um, generally, but just, just to focus on women, I'll take one woman, Roisin Walsh from Clocher in County Tyrone. She had a degree, another degree from Cambridge. She taught in Germany. She joins Cumberland in Belfast, taught in St. Mary's, was forced to leave Belfast during, due to intimidation. And then she becomes the first female rates collector for Tyrone County Council, but won't take the oath of allegiance. So ends up moving to Dublin. But in Dublin, she becomes the Dublin City Librarian, has a really important public role after that. And somebody who, you know, could have uh, been really important in the North. Lillian Metcher, um, the Lisbon suffragette uh, who tried to blow up Lisbon Cathedral, she ends up in Dublin as well. And there are many other women who just find the North too difficult an environment to stay. And partition comes as a dreadful blow. Hannah Sheehy Skeffington described it as a crazy patchwork quilt. She's cut off from her Skeffington in-laws in the North. In 1913, she'd spoken at a suffrage meet in the Normo Park. In 1933, she's arrested and given a month in Armagh jail for defying a banning order, banning her from the six counties. So women are absolutely torn apart. Um, in February 1922, coming the man of the first organisation to reject the treaty, um, all the Ulster delegates vote against it. They say it let down the people of the North. Um, we have elections to the Northern Ireland Parliament. We have two women, Julia McMordy and Dara Ch Chichester. Even though the Ulster Women's Council doesn't support putting forward women, we end up with two women. But what we also have is not only a Protestant parliament for Protestant people, we have a male parliament for Protestant male people. And we never have women in parliamentary life in the North. We have never have women having any say in what is going to happen um, as the North um, establishes itself. And finally, I think symbolically in August 1922, Winifred Carney is arrested and all the, she looked after the Republican Prisoners Dependence Fund and the names of all the Republicans uh, uh, who were getting support from that fund were seized by the authorities because she was the secretary. And it marks the ends of Republican resistance People talk about, you know, the seizure of documents signalling, you know, the end of the IRA, but few know about the role taken by Winifred Carney. And I think it underlines the importance of viewing those years through a gendered lens. So the exclusion of women from public and political life, North and South, has huge consequences for the development of both states, as we continue to realise now, say, for example, with the truth emerging on mother and baby homes. Thank you very much, Margaret. That was another extraordinary glimpse of uh, aspects of, of Irish history that are insufficiently explored at this point. But um, obviously your own contribution is, is um, that of some of the people you mentioned, like Linda Connolly and Mary McAuliffe, is changing that. Um, I think between between the three of our of our contributions now, we've got a really, really rich um, 
theme of, of work to, to question. And I, I can see that some people have put in questions. Um, I was asked by Paul at the beginning to ask people to use the Q&A rather than the chat function for your questions. So if anybody has put their questions into chat, maybe you could move them into Q&A now, although I know Paula has reminded you already. But to start off with now, I'd like to ask our panellists to, to have a bit of a discussion among themselves about, about what they've heard. Um, maybe starting with yourself, Myrtle, if you'd like to maybe ask... Um, Robert, something about, about his presentation? I think it's fascinating to get uh, that wider view and also a much wider view of the ideologies and so forth that were in place at the time. Um, I, I feel, for example, that the uh, influence of Russia uh, was very important in generating the anti-socialist, anti-trade union mm -hmm. um, feeling uh, in Britain and elsewhere. Um, I think the links between, forged between perhaps nationalism and socialism uh, kind of, if you like, redoubled the threat to unionism. Uh, but uh, for, for me, I think the keeping together uh, those different sectors uh, of society um, over that period of time um, was critical. And I've often found it um, very perplexing uh, that other struggles were so lost uh, beneath that um, for partition. And in looking at unionism uh, in particular, um, I agree with Margaret about unionist lack of engagement with women in politics in many, many ways. Um, although once that state was formed, uh, the, the first elections to Northern Ireland uh, and before those elections, saw the Ulster Women's Unionist Council making an all-out effort to um, ensure that uh, unionists and Protestant women uh, were registered to vote and explaining the system to them and bringing them on board. And indeed, those two women, uh, mind it, they, they were elected because they were unionists rather than because they were women. But nonetheless, the uh, because of the change in the franchise when women did get the vote, the Ulster Unionist Council brought 10 members uh, of the Women's Council into their own body. So there's more engagement and involvement uh, there. I think the problem for many of us in looking at this is that unionist women focused all of their energies really, a majority of them by no means all, um, on the union and on strengthening and upholding that government. Um, and it would be some time before that minority who saw women's wider advances um, really had any effect. Okay, thanks, Myrtle. Robert, can I just bring you in here now? Would you like to, to respond to some of the things that, uh, that Myrtle has just said and also uh, what uh, the contribution that Margaret and Myrtle have made to our discussion? I think, I think what it shows particularly um, <clears throat> is just how rich this subject is. I mean, these whole, all these areas and these different groups and, and these different perspectives have, have just not been explored at all. Um, what I find fascinating is we often get this almost ranking in history of what is the most important identity for people. And as I've said, as I alluded when I spoke, there is, you know, this nationalism identity, number one, and then we sort of move down these ranks and so on. And I think it's fascinating when you when you, you listen to what Myrtle's saying, she's talking about this 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 world of this post-war world of of militancy and this energy and frustration. I find it remarkable. I mean I've been looking into um, the, the riots we get, we get shipyard expulsions of course taking place all over Britain as well. You know, we get um, race riots, pogroms, if you like, in Chicago against black workers. Um, it is remarkable how, what the First World War does to so many people and, and brings so many so many things out. Um, I just wonder about the, the, the place of Bolshevism. I mean, I think that is something absolutely needs to be explored because that is always there. I mean, whenever you read any of this, um, any, Particularly unionists, and you reach unionists, um, 
you, there always is that word Bolshevism thrown in, the threats of socialism and so on. And it's kind of becomes mixed up, as you say, with nationalism. I just, I don't think that's an area we, that's been explored enough at all. Um, but this idea of the red menace, you know, is very, very strong. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I've just actually made me giggle when um, <clears throat> uh, Margaret was talking about Roger McCauley. Roger, Roger McCauley doesn't like anybody, by the way. He's just such an awful man. Um, he, <laughs> he's a dreadful leader of the Belfast IRA. He's not any, any person at all. So I wouldn't worry too much about him. I thought it, I mean, it was very interesting. I mean, this is both for um, both my fellow panelists. Um, and I'm talking about this sort of ranking, and where this, where this comes up is I've been I've been um, teaching actually on the issue of women's suffrage in the United States. And what I found remarkable about looking into that is the way that, as I say, these identities, race and and gender, for example, in America, the way they compete with one another, and the racial issue seems to win out, you know, for so many women in America. And I just wondered. Where do you kind of situate, as it were, the unionism, the nationalism, and so where does that actually fit in terms of identity? So you know, I, I was looking at um, Ida B. Wells, for example, as a great example, you know, example of someone who's excluded, a great, a great feminist activist and so on, but excluded because she's black and, and um, it doesn't sort of play into this narrative of white women and so on. So sorry, that's just a general kind of remark, this, where this identity thing fits, sorry. Yeah, um, Margaret, would you like to take up that subject, uh, the, the, the identity ranking and, and, and those kind of issues that Robert has just raised? Because obviously those are still great preoccupations, particularly in, in Northern Ireland. Yes, um, and, and, and we're always difficult at the height of the um, uh, suffrage campaign. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes Irish women kind of united against this feeling that they were treated by the British suffrage movement as colonial subordinates. You know, um, was this real high handedness really that kind of imperial connection um, so that Christabel Pankhurst would tell them all to come to one of the big suffrage processions in, in Hyde Park dressed as Irish Colleen's? Uh, is it you know it's women who've got degrees and see themselves as very much part of you know modern Ireland and they're not going to come as shawls and and all the rest of it interesting the one the women who do come dressed with shawls are the are the Irish women who live in London but the, the, the women who live in in Ireland don't so it's always that negotiation um there and I think that that would that would have been felt equally um Unionist women obviously wouldn't have felt that that either. Um, I just wanted to say something about the, the Bolshevism thing. Um, when you look at Winifred Carney's election manifesto for a workers' republic, it is nothing like any of the Sinn Féin candidates. She's completely, mm -hmm. she is a Bolshevik in that. And uh, I mean, she's called, her nickname is Karnovich with her <laughs> friends, Kahalo Shannon, always called her Karnovich, and um, other people I've seen in letters called her Karnovich. So there is that, but you know, you can see how she is sidelined. She's not supported by Sinn Féin. They're uncomfortable um, with her very left-leaning message. And she talks about the destruction of capitalism and, you know, the fat capitalists, you know, gaining their riches because she's using all her experience of the mills um, and having acted as the secretary of the Irish Women Workers Union, uh, the, the, the textile workers union in, in that. So her, her identity is, is very much as a socialist and a feminist and as a republican. Um, and women, when you when you read letters, I think that they may be more open there. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have letters, uh, say, saying that so and so is far too unionist. Um, she doesn't really, but they would never mm -hmm. say those kind of things in in public. Mm -hmm. they're, they're done in private. They really try very hard not to um, accuse a woman of, of of having a political position because she's nationalist or unionist it's very much trying to say we're all trying to get women's voices heard in a new society 
Okay, thanks, mm. Margaret. Uh, we have a lot of interesting questions, and so I'm just going to to um, take take some of those now. Uh, the first question is from Elliot Wilson, and he says, uh, "Did any other countries have analogous separatist movements in the 1910s, and did they look at Ireland for lessons or warnings?" Now, I think that question's a little bit big for the time that we have, so let's just look at. <laughs> Do we know of any other movements that looked to Ireland for lessons or warnings? And it would be wonderful to know that um, if we haven't solved our own problems, we've maybe solved problems somewhere else. So uh, would anybody, maybe Robert, that's one for you. Uh, um, yeah, I think I think Ireland is is very precocious when it comes to these uh, rebellions. Absolutely, it, do, it does really sort of uh, set the standard. And people do people absolutely do look to Ireland from all these various uh, mm -hmm. nationalist movements. Because what, what you also get, of course, and this is often forgotten, this is an interesting aspect of this, is you get the interaction between Irish nationalists and, say, Indian nationalists, other, mm -hmm. color, other mixing together in Paris, in Berlin, all coming together and sharing the, these kind of ideas. But no, I think the Irish example, absolutely, because the diaspora is incredibly important in terms of spreading that. And that that particular story, as it were, around um, you know, and that's going to be important, obviously, in places like Australia and so on, and and, and all over the place. So, no, I, I, absolutely, I think Ireland is Ireland is, yeah, it's the uh, well, in India is oh, one yeah. of the most important um, countries in terms of that alliance. I mean, Maud gone in Paris, mm. it's up in mm. Irish India independence movement is really mm. friendly with. Um, Madam Bikaji Karma, who's one of the leading Indian nationalists involved in their liberation struggle. And, and later on, during the, when the Free States established Maud Gon and people like Charlotte Despard are all part of the Irish Indian independence movement, which a lot of Republicans, Frank Ryan, Padre O'Donnell and all are part of. So that stays all the time. The, where the British Empire has been or is, you will also see links with, with Irish anti-imperialists. I think that's um, true. I also think the uh, very international nature of the suffrage movement also contributed uh, to those kinds of, of discussions. A, a quick glance through the Irish Citizen, uh, the suffrage newspaper in Ireland, reveals you know, uh, calls coming in from everywhere about the best strategies, about how they can help each other, and, and lots of information about the, their countries um, and how they can move forward, both for women and in a broader way. Yes, Margaret Cousins, who's, a, who's a, an Irish suffragette, you know, imprisoned in Ireland, goes to India, helps to set up an All-Ireland uh, uh, an all Indian women's organization ends up in the 1930s spending a year in jail because she's part of the independence struggle. So there's huge links there. It is interesting, okay. isn't it? Because I want to, I want to just sorry, move sorry, on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We actually have quite a lot of questions here. Yeah. Um, there's a question here from Lorraine Mills. Um, were any women involved in the actual partition negotiations? No. Only in a behind the scenes kind of way. Secretaries. Secretaries. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah, Constance Markovich said that she wished she had be, had gone, but she knew they wouldn't want her to go, and she regretted the fact that Lily O'Brennan was one of the women there. She was a Kamenamon member, but she was there as part of the Secretariat. Well, what they were doing was keeping really Sinn Féin going, really, while every while the men were in prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a pretty straightforward answer. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Patrick Wilson, um, you mentioned that the Government of Ireland Act represented the option that was favoured by British government and possibly the most extreme choice. What other options were available to them? And do you think any of them would have been agreed by unionism in the North, uh, given the fact that the partition of Ireland was widely viewed at that time as delusional? Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting thing that you raised, Robert, at the very beginning, mm. you know, that, uh, mm. that this unthinkable thing within a few mm. years became reality. Yeah, it so is. It is. That you'd start on that one. Yeah, it is absolutely remarkable. As I said, when I talk about this this idea of um, the two nations of Ireland thing, and you know, historians, as I said, have scoured the past because you know historians are very are not very good at predicting the future, but you know they're very good at predicting the past. And of course, they look back with hindsight, and of course, they they're desperate to find some great precedent, or but there really isn't anything. And as I say, that's why the context, which is 
you know, what's been sort of wonderfully shown up um, by the other speakers there is, is so absolutely important. And when you talk about the Government of Ireland Act, as I say, they're very worried, particularly about international opinion. And the idea, the idea they have, one is a county option where every county can basically vote itself out. That's an idea, maybe. The trouble is with that is no government ever works like that. And it looks as if Britain is basically just through some sort of colonial spite holding on to as much of Ireland as it can. Um, and of course, it's not only fair to minorities. That's as I say, the other idea of filling the Senate full of unionists, and then but that's the Protestant ascendancy again, basically writ large. Really, what the British want to do, because as I say, because of the the mood of the times and this obsession with American opinion, which they, they owe so much money to America, is they want to basically get out of Ireland, but try and make it look as if they are devolving power, which is happening all over Europe as well. And I think you know the government of Ireland that is basically, the, I think, the best thing they can come up with. And it's it's quite a sharp move from the British because it throws the it throws the ball now back to the Irish and saying, well, you know, you can just, if you want to unify, then you, you do it. We've given you the tools. I think it's important that it was very much believed to be a temporary situation mm. and that the Boundary Commission uh, was muted, that that would uh, make a difference. I think it was war and 1916, um, mm. which made the huge difference. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a question here uh, from Jenny Methven uh, talking about radical Protestant movements. Uh, she says, um, what of Ulster Protestant opposition to Carson's unionism uh, led by a casement Jack White and Reverend Armour, which attracted some popular support around 1913? Anybody like to have a look at that? Myrtle? Well, th there definitely was uh, a kind of pro-home rule um, strand amongst Presbyterians. Um, I, I, I'm too far away from all the various names and so forth, so I do remember doing a, an article in this a long time ago. Um, I think that was an important strand and very much in the mould of liberal uh, intellectual Presbyterianism. But I think for that movement, uh, again, the context in which they were putting their arguments made it very difficult for them to be um, widely disseminated uh, and heard. Um, you know, there was um, uh, opposition from neighbours and farming communities and, and, and so forth. Um, and I, I think the issue is that they weren't um, a movement as far as I can recall, uh, that um, was motivated by marches and demonstrations and big rallies. Um, there is some interesting stuff. Um, there is a series of uh, letters and so forth um, outlining the position of Irish Presbyterian um, home rulers. Uh, and I find it absolutely uh, fascinating. I find that more, if you like, radical or lefty unionists no, not unionists, radical lefty Protestants were more likely to be engaged in things like the cooperative movement um, and in the growing labour movement uh, and so forth. But I think it, it was a matter of what we've been saying throughout that total predominance uh, of the um, constitutional debate which really kept everything else under guard. Uh, and really it's only in the last few decades that we are able as historians to um, see what was going on uh, in other areas because historians as well as contemporaries all focus on the big constitutional issue. I think, yeah. sorry, I don't know if you want to try, but I, I no, think, ahead. yeah, I think just very quickly, I mean, remember what you've got, the Ulster Unionists are a project, they're a project, a revolutionary project. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a project, remember, you're talking about excluding unionists, of course, you know, Southern Unionists uh, are one group who are jettisoned, but also border unionists as well. Are people who've gone to the, you know, they've been there in 1912 and 1913. These are people as well who are, who are jettisoned as well. So in that sense, it's very much a Belfast East Ulster movement that has, has really hijacked Irish unionism in this period. In the same way you could say happens with nationalist movements as well. So yeah, I think there is a, there's, a, there's an internal revolution in so many different parts of Ireland. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so the next question actually relates to that. This is a question about class. Um, Paul Fleming says, in how far, uh, how far does the ascendancy, both men and women, remain a leadership force during and post partition? Um, anybody want to take that one on? Maybe Margaret, would you like to start on that one? Um, I just, I was just doing some work on the um, glens of Antrim and the sort of Gaelic revival that happened there that was very much uh, part of the Protestant ascendancy at that, that um, uh, locally. Um, and a lot of them, you know, uh, were nationalists, but not all of them. Quite a lot of them remained unionist, but whether they gave political leadership later on, I'm not so sure. I mean, what you have are the the Londonderries, for example, in uh, um, liaising with the British aristocracy um, and having that kind of influence there, that they don't necessarily, uh, you, and you have Lord Londonderry then in the cabinet, um, he's education minister. I mean, you have various people there that are, are part of it, and their women folk are very much part of it, not as elected representatives, but they, they have that ear of the British elite, the British aristocracy, you know, have all that stuff about Newton Stewart, um, the ARC mm. people meeting there. They have a kind of a privileged way of, 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 of having their own voices heard in a way that um, is really quite different. And how that works in terms of when Stormont is up and running with it, when you've got a Northern Ireland parliament and you have this, um, ascendancy class at the same time. I mean, maybe the other panelists could talk about the, the interrelationships between them, but I think it's really, you know, the Protestant uh, uh, population is very interesting as, as Myrtle's teasing out parts of it, because you've also got people like Jack White from Balamoney, you know, who helps to set up the Irish citizen army um, and is in Dublin for a while, but he comes back north, you know, he's never reconciled, he's still a, you know, somebody on, on the left. You've got people like that as well, who, who would be, but, but part of um, Protestantism, if you like, but um, not necessarily ascendancy. Um, do, do they just get on with, um, you know, their private lives with, you know, uh, wealth production or what or are they are they part of the politics in the future I th I'm not so sure I think, sorry yeah I, th I think what i mean i talked about this revolution i think what you're also seeing in this as it east also the revolution is a big shift towards the the business elites of mm. um east but east east, sorry, east Ulster. you're definitely seeing that kind of shift and if you look, for example, you know, if you look at, say, landed MPs, how many MPs are landed, they, they almost completely disappear. I think there's only one mm -hmm. left think, you know, when we go, as we go through partition. Of course, the big division, of course, is going to be between Southern Unionists. And there's a lot of old landed aristocracy ar mm -hmm. people in the South. And of course, those unions themselves are split between, well, split between basically selling up and leaving or between coming to some kind of accommodation with this new devolved Dublin government whatever it's going to be and you know the, the this real rift that you get when you have the irish convention i mean it does get incredibly bitter mm -hmm. where ulster mm -hmm. unionists basically say you know this is a sinking ship are you going to deny us a lifeboat you know you get all that kind of stuff so i think there is a big rift as part of this sort of revolution right. as well mm -hmm. i agree that um sort of power is moving away from the aristocracy throughout uh, this period um Interestingly, uh, the Women's Legion was formed uh, during the First World War by Lady Londonderry, again, providing leadership in putting women into men's jobs, uh, if you like. That's a, a, an interesting example. And in the Ulster Women's Unionist Council, um, coming up to and around and just following partition, uh, there was uh, outrage at what was seen as the betrayal of the three other counties. Uh, and they wanted to put together a plan to rescue uh, the Protestants from there, who had, as you've said, signed um, the proclamation and the, the declaration, sorry, the, um, 
what do you call it, <laughs> and mm-hmm. the decoration, uh, and therefore, you know, that they needed to be rescued uh, in some way. I think amongst the women, that sort of leadership uh, in unionism goes on for a fair wee bit mm. because they do elect um, to leading um, women from the Unionist Council uh, to the first Northern Ireland government. And one of those, um, uh, Deidre Parker, remains in position until 1960. But it's not leadership of women, I have to say. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's another question here, which is late, related to that, and I think it's it's probably yourself should should address it, Myrtle. Um, you mentioned earlier about the fascinatingly about the role of Lady Londonderry, that that sort of behind mm-hmm. the scenes hosting people thing. And Fiona Byrne says, um, do you feel that Hazel Lavery made a behind the scenes contribution in London, uh, hosting Churchill Collins and so on? Oh, I don't know specifically about that. I'm sure she did. I think the role of women. Um, in, you know, like in the French salons and the revolutionary period, uh, I think women did carry a lot of influence uh, behind the scenes at at that time. Um, uh, Lady Londonderry certainly was, um, I suppose, more articulate, more pushy, more um, to the fore in uh, expanding uh, unionist demands and making sure that things were moving in a, in a way that she would have approved of. Um, but I, I think that that whole issue uh, of women working behind the scenes uh, is something that shouldn't um, be overlooked. And but, you know, just, if, just uh, if anyone is interested, particularly in Hazel Lavery, um, mm-hmm. Shane McCool has a fascinating biography of her and it's well worth looking at it because I think she isn't the only one who's who's used in that way as a hostess in order to um, Mm -hmm. send messages, you know, back channels, basically, glamorous back channels. Mm -hmm. Diane Urquhart's work is very interesting on Lady Londonderry um, and that side of the aristocracy. She's done a lot of good work on that. Okay. Um, There's another, a different type of question entirely here from Frank McHugh. Uh, Robert made reference to the decline of prosperity in Belfast. Has much work been done on why Belfast declined in prosperity in the post-partition period? Well, I think, sorry, yeah, I think, sorry, yeah, I think um, what you've got really is, um, you've got this, of course, after the war itself, you have this economic downturn everywhere. I mean, about what Belfast supplying, which, you know, obviously our ships, um, and obviously limit knapsacks and so on. The demand for this basically collapses when the First World War ends. And you have, so you have a chronic global problem now of oversupply. And you basically get to a condition really where the world doesn't want what Belfast is selling. And of course, even when it has ships that it's producing, um, it might be still be able to produce ships, but the prices for them now just begin to fall away. Um, so it's really a, a global economic problem, really. You, all, you know, this always kind of happens after the uh, after the war. And, you know, we talk about the shipyard expulsions, we mentioned all that kind of thing, of course, you know, on about bringing Catholics back after the shipyard expulsions. But, you know, that industry itself is in decline already, that it's not any jobs for anybody, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really a, a kind of global problem that you've got. Same with agriculture as well. I mean, the massive mm-hmm. demand for food and so on. Okay, would either of the other two panellists well, like to address that? There's also the um, the economic boycott of Belfast that, that um, is conducted by um, Republicans, which obviously doesn't affect shipyard, the shipyards or linen mills because they're there for an external audience, but it does have an effect on the smaller business people, um, uh, affects the banks, um, uh, quite seriously as people you know pull out investing in 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 banks that have their headquarters in the north so it has all sorts of other repercussions later on and you get people even for example Belfast Republican Dennis uh, McCulloch who has a music business in uh, Queen Street that's affected by the Belfast boycott and it collapses and it's one of the reasons he ends up moving to the north so there are other kind of smaller less global issues that also that are affecting the North at this time. 
And it does then help explain the the greater um, rise of socialist tendencies in the 1930s in particular. Um, so it has a, a, a long lasting effect, I think, on labour as a whole. Uh, Claire Hackett has a question here. Can you tell us more about what men and women on both sides of the border thought in the immediate post-partition period about whether partition was permanent? Any of any of you like to uh, address that one? I think um, yeah, I think um, Myrtle mentioned the fact that this idea of, of, of partition is temporary is absolutely right. I mean, this idea they they do do this. This idea of the way they can squeak through partition is pretending that it's provisional. And how the, the border itself is going to be reversible and so on. And really, it's not until you get to the Boundary Commission, really, when that actual when that issue is settled, there is a huge amount of flux in border areas. Because, you know, from Southern propaganda is all about we're going to have Tyrone and Fermanagh and Jerry and South Armagh. We're going to, four counties barely are going to be left. Where, of course, I'm from Northern Unionists. There's this promise of we're going to get East Tony Gaul and who knows, a bit of North Monaghan and so on, which leads to massive instability, really. So there's an ongoing, so, you know, playing silly politics with people's lives really is what, what's going on here. Because this leads to all kinds of violence. It leads to, um, Forced migrations over the border. It, it, you know, it's a dreadful place to be with all this kind of uncertainty. So, and you know, I think so. I think that sense of uncertainty and so on isn't really settled for a, really a long, long time. I wanted to ask uh, Robert a question about that mm. because um, Maud Gone talks about when um, women are looking after refugees from Belfast, mm. 1922, and. Mm them up in the Fowler Hall and various places. You've got a lot of, you know, thousands of women and children traumatised from the north and they want to do something. And she talks to Collins and Griffith, who both say we need to get them back up the north. We don't want to make this an issue with the northern authorities because we don't want to have an adverse effect on a future plebiscite. And mm. what is the plebiscite? Is this the Boundary Commission? Do they yeah. going to... Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah, this is yeah, this is the idea that's being used because that they go, there's going to be some kind of plebiscite in the future, um, and there isn't a plebiscite in the end. But that's what's happened, of course, in on the continent with Versailles, yeah. and that's what's expected. Of course, when the Boundary Commission sits, that idea is completely rejected and it ends up what it ends up as. But no, you're absolutely right. I mean, the treatment of Belfast refugees in Dublin is, is very, very it, it, it's very, very tragic. Because these people are coming down to, to Dublin now, as you say, fleeing terrible persecution, burned out of their houses with their little bundles, and they arrive in Dublin. They're not particularly wanted by the, the provisional government, the free state government at all, who want them, as you say, to go back and will give them money basically to get trains back um, because of this issue. And also this kind of idea that northerners are going to bring down all this sectarianism and stuff, and they don't want that mm. spilling into mm. Dublin. Mm. The only people who really help them, ironically, of course, are the um, the IRA in Dublin. Mm. They're the people who actually do, as you say, take over the Fowler Hall and, and all these different places. But, you know, their, obviously their methods of doing this are, um, are rather crude. And, of course, leaves the refugees rather tarred with this image of being, as it were, pro-treaty, on the pro-treaty side of things. And so these poor people go from... Yeah. You could say, one civil war and end up in another one almost mm. immediately you know it's a, it's a very very and most of them end up going back of course it's a sad sad um, story there's a question here which is going right back to the 17th century um it may be a bit there there's quite a few questions in which are sort of uh would take us a lot much longer time than we have to talk to but this this might be worth just uh, touching on uh patrick McMenamin says um uh, would it be realistic to say that if we go back to the Scottish plantation in the 17th century in the Northeast, that we have the seeds of partition and that it was always inevitable that a partition state that would be created after the War of Independence? It's a huge question, but it's it's probably one that we can at least touch on now. I, I don't know if you, I, you want me to go. I don't know, Susan, but uh, yeah, I would say absolutely yeah, not. No, I, I don't think anything's inevitable in history. Yeah. No, absolutely yeah. not. And um, what you've really got happening, as I say, when you talk about time and place and so on, what you've really got is changing identities in Ireland, of course. And I think Myrtle made this point that what, what you've got in Ulster is a reaction against what's happened to Irish nationalism. 
and you get this very terror, you get this partial sort of Irish nationalism, which really excludes, you know, in its rhetoric, in its in its worldview, really. Um, everything that something somewhere like East Ulster comes to comes to represent, and you know you get the development, and that's a very much a nineteenth century thing. You get that yeah. all over the place in lots of different you know lots of different states. People you know once you start defining as it were what you are, you have to define what you're not, and you know what ha- in East Ulster Ulster Protestants become what they're not. They're they're almost the mirror image of everything that this increasingly Catholic, increasingly Gaelic and green and rural Irish island type nationalism develops. So, no, I don't think there's anything at all inevitable about that. I think the word inevitable is one that all historians really would um, Mm -hmm. reject. Um, It's a much more uh, complex and complicated story, um, which relies on a confluence uh, of events. there was a kind of, I guess, um, demographic foundation, which could be then used in the creation of that uh, very Ulster identity. Yeah, I mean, you've got all sorts of counterfactuals, haven't you? What what would have happened if Parnell, you know, hadn't been involved in a divorce uh, case and the Irish Parliamentary Party hadn't split? You know, what if the House of Lords hadn't had the veto so that Gladstone's Home Rule Bill could have got through? You had somebody like Gladstone who mm-hmm. believed in Home Rule, as opposed to when we come to the third Home Rule Bill, you've got Asquith, who doesn't really, who's, you know, it's because the Irish Parliamentary Party have the balance of power at Westminster mm-hmm. that the third Home Rule Bill is even put forward. And yet, and then you've got this huge resistance by... Um, all of those who are in positions of power in the British elite at that time. So there's, you know, could it have been different, you know, at different times in history as well? I, I think, I mean, you know, that's what, as I say, that's what historians do. I always think about the Munster Republic during the Civil War. You know, if the Munster Republic had lasted and somehow there was a peace treaty and it lasted for a while, you can guarantee historians now would be searching for the past and say, oh, well, Munster was always different. You know, they would do, that was how, that's what, that's what we all do. We'd look back and, oh, we'd find the threads of independence and so on. So, no, I don't, I mean, I suppose, you know, Ireland and anywhere can have as many nations as it can safely imagine, if you like, if you want to think about it, kind of that way, you know. So I don't think, no, I agree completely. So all of you have talked about, you know, the, the historians don't like the idea of inevitability. We've got a lot of questions in from people asking you to predict the future, which <laughs> I don't think I'm going to, which I don't think I'm going to pass on to you at this point. When we've only got a few minutes left, and also, also you would probably this, say the same about historians <laughs> predicting the future. But just to to finish up in the last um, ten minutes or so, could, I would like to ask all of you if 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 there's any lesson or lessons that you think we can learn at the present time from what happened during the period you've been talking about of, of partition, what do you think they would be? You know, what, what is there usefully to be learned in terms of our present, if you can call it a crisis, if we ever have anything other than crises, but it does seem like quite a volatile moment right now, doesn't it? Is there, are there things that we can take from the sort of things you've been discussing this afternoon. I mean, I'm thinking of very simple things, perhaps like the inclusion of women, mm-hmm. uh, which still is an issue, obviously. You know, we, we've still got a situation where it is considered quite normal to have conversations which do not include any kind of uh, gendered aspect whatsoever or none, none that's acknowledged in any case. Well, following on from that, Susan, I mean, you know, there's, there, there's been a lot of discussion about having citizens' assemblies to discuss mm-hmm. uh, really contentious issues, which has been done very successfully in, in, in the South in relation to, for example, abortion. Um, and, you know, starting to have those kind of discussions, I think one of the lessons from history is it can't be left to an elite level. Um, it, mm-hmm. needs to, it needs to involve everybody. And, and I think, you know, people aren't just simply subjects. They have to be more than that. They have to be participants Um, because people have all sorts of fears. And if those fears aren't addressed, then they fester and manifest themselves in all sorts of different ways. So I think that that kind of discussion and bringing an inclusivity and bringing Mm. people in, and it's a process 
Um, it's not something that happens just at a particular, you know, mm -hmm. event in time now that as, makes people very, very nervous about the future. Um, you know, so I, I think it has to be something that's seen gradually. But I mean, I, for me, the message is that, you know, we cannot continue as we are. You know, it's not sustainable how we are, but how we can get to something else that 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 satisfies people and addresses the, the needs of ordinary uh, women and men is what's really important and what's the mechanism to be mm. doing that. And it simply can't be at a, you know, the level of political parties. I think what this last year has shown us is how quickly the world can change, uh, both locally and, and globally. Um, and on one hand, that makes it's all terrible. And on the other hand, you think, well, all things are possible if the world can change to this degree. Now, it's, it's OK to work from home, as some of us have argued for a very long time. And all of those other changes that have come about um, make it a, a different, give us a different starting point, I think. I absolutely agree that inclusivity uh, is the absolute key um, I mean, here we are in a situation when you look at the European uh, issue where the government can take an absolutely opposite stance to the people and push things through that, that are not wanted. Um, and that process, I think, I'm very encouraged. I, I know there's a project on uh, constitutional conversations um, that uh, Eilish Rene and Joanna McMinn and others are engaged in. And I find that kind of project very promising um, because it is about talking about what people's fears are and their anxieties and the ways in which we can work together um, that will bring us somewhere, hopefully. Thanks, Myrtle. Uh, Robert, what about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I agree totally with those answers. They're wonderful, um, insightful answers. I suppose just to pick on, up on this idea of fear and I suppose to go back to the history a little bit, you're abs it's absolutely right. Fear is what underlies all, all, all this whole thing. And what you've got really with partition, I think the problem with it is that it answers the wrong question. That is not the question. I hope we've shown you there. There are all kinds of other questions, social, cultural, um, um, gender questions, all religious, all these things are actually questions that need to be um, that need to be answered at the time. And, and, and really what emerges is this incredibly crude sort of black and white choice where all this wonderful, rich, heterogeneous kind of Irish population that we've got, you just made made into this kind of crude, um, kind of black and white choice. I would say, I suppose, looking forward, and this is what I mentioned when I, I did my little talk there, I do think if we move increasingly partition as a subject back to the centre of the Irish experience, um, this can be something that all Irish people shared as an experience. Um, and I think rather than, as we say, we have these divided national histories and so on. If you move partition back in, ironically, as a subject, it may help to have some kind of shared Irish story and, and shared sense of unity, maybe in the future. <laughs> that's a radical idea, the notion mm. that we could all have something in common. <laughs> um, okay, thank you all so much. Um, it's been a really great discussion. I still wish that we could have been in Derry, but uh, given that we aren't, I think that, you know, you've, you've really brought these subjects alive for people and I hope that um, the audience has, en has enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, you can find, uh, I'm sure that some of the people who are, who are here with us today are familiar with, with your work, but but um, if you aren't, do look Margaret Ward, Myrtle Hill and Robert Lynch up and, and read some more of their work because, you know, the amount of time that they've had today, they've packed so much into it, but there is so much else there. So uh, that is well worth doing. And also, as Bernadette said at the beginning, please do look into the archives of the Tower Museum and also have a look at the fantastic work that the um, Nerve Centre is, is doing in Derry because they're both great institutions. Um, I'd like to just finish up this afternoon by thanking Paula Larkin, who has really made this whole uh, event possible and has made it run very smoothly. She's the Community Engagement Officer for this Decade of Communities, um, Decade of Commemorations project. And uh, I'd like to thank Adrian Grant as well, Dr. Adrian Grant, who's the architect of 
of this whole project and who has been sort of making things work and drawing together some of the people who have synthesized so well as we've seen this afternoon. And I'd like to thank Bernadette, who we heard from at the beginning, uh, the archivist at the Tower Museum as well for the input that she has had to this. So thank you all very much for your contributions and thank you very much to all of the people in the audience who have contributed. There have been a lot of very interesting questions which we haven't got to, but I think that you'll agree that the panelists have um, addressed the questions that we did get to very thoroughly. Some of the specific questions that people have put in, I think the panelists will be able to maybe answer um, by email, you know, if somebody's looking for a particular answer to a particular type of question. So thank you very very, very much, everybody. And I hope that um, we'll see you again, maybe on Friday at the next session of, of the conference. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.